One of my favorite things about Super Bowl weekend are the commercials. Uh, and really, the commercials would have to be one of my favorite things about Super Bowl weekend since the Cowboys haven't been in so long, right? Uh, and so about this time every year, I find myself just anticipating the Super Bowl commercials and also thinking about some of my favorites in the past. I, my, the earliest Super Bowl commercial I remember is obviously Mean Joe Green in the Coca-Cola commercial, right? And the jersey and all that kind of good stuff that they remade years and years later. But I, my absolute favorite might surprise you because it is a spoof. It's a spoof off of uh, the Tom Hanks movie, Castaway, that was made around 2000. And some of you remember that movie where he's a FedEx worker, that he's on a plane, he's flying over the Pacific Ocean, the plane goes down in a massive storm, everybody on board the FedEx plane perishes except for him, and he floats ashore this deserted island uh, along with all these FedEx packages. And so he's this guy trying to survive on this deserted island, and he doesn't know how long he's going to be there. And, of course, part of the plot is he's learning how to live on this island, and he winds up starting to open up some of the FedEx packages, which is a big no-no, but he doesn't know how long he's going to be there, and he's looking for things to help him survive on this island. And so he, But there's one particular package that he never opens, if you remember the, this entire movie. And so the movie ends with him getting rescued, and then there's this epilogue where at the very end of the movie... Uh, Hanks delivers the, the one package he never opened on the island after five years on this deserted island. The one package he never opens, he delivers it to the address it had been sent to five years earlier. And of all things, if you remember, it's in West Texas. That's where they shot this scene, right by this farm-to-market road. And, of course, um, you have no idea what's in the package. The movie just ends with him delivering uh, the package. Now you're ready for the spoof that was done. Check this out. Hi. Hi. I was marooned on an island for five years with this package. And I swore that I would deliver it to you because I work for FedEx. That's very admirable. Thank you. Hey, well, by the way, what's in the package? Huh, nothing really. Just a satellite phone, GPS locator, fishing rod, water purifier, and some seeds. Just silly stuff. Thank you again. You keep up the good work. I just love that commercial. Uh, I love that commercial for a lot of reasons, one of which it just plays right into our hands with the Bible because there are so many things within Scripture that can make a literal difference in your quality of life. Amen? So many things. And yet, you've got to open it up and see what's inside in order for it to make a difference. We've kind of been in the midst of that already uh, by journeying through in the red in the month of January that's given us a chance to be in the words of Jesus Monday through Friday in January. And a lot of you are part of the Facebook page as well. Guess what? You can pick up in the red too today because we've decided uh, to go ahead and just extend this thing out one more month because we're not yet done with uh, all the red letters, the words of Jesus. And so uh, this is, contains your readings Monday through Friday uh, for the month of February, beginning February 3rd. That is this coming Monday. And so I want to encourage you to pick up one of these in your lobby on the way out. There's also an online version you can find on the app and on our website as well as uh, we just continue to open it up. It'll make a difference in our life. Now, here's a second way, by the way, uh, that I hope uh, to make a difference. And that's, I'm going to go back to the box of Scripture, so to speak, and I'm going to pull something else out for you on the weekends that I hope will make a difference from now leading all the way up to Easter. Because uh, today we begin a journey through Exodus chapter 1 through chapter 14 that's going to take us all the way up to Easter. And I'm calling this tour of this part of Exodus deliverance. 
And you might be surprised how much the story of Exodus in your Old Testament has to do with the story of Jesus. And if anything, the story of Jesus is going to shed new light on the story of Exodus. Depending upon how well you know Jesus, you can see Jesus a lot in Exodus. And believe it or not, you can actually see the story of Exodus a lot in the story of Jesus and you. I'll tell you something else. You're going to find out that this powerful story we're about to walk through is going to speak in some profound ways in very practical areas of your life as a follower of Jesus and as a human being. And I want you to know this is more than just about the deliverance of a group of people. That's the plot of this part of Exodus. This is also about the deliverance of an individual named Moses. And his deliverance has everything to do with the deliverance of God's people. And what's interesting is Moses has to be delivered so that God's people can be delivered. And my prayer is that the story of his deliverance and the story of Israel's deliverance is going to speak into our deliverance in some very fresh and powerful ways. Amen? So I want to encourage you, if you've got your Bibles, you can open up Exodus chapter 1. In just a moment, the text will be on the screen, but you may have your own Bibles with you, or you can pull them up on your phones. Uh, to help you appreciate what you're about to read in Exodus chapter 1, I need a, 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 just to give you a little bit of background. You know the story of Exodus is about uh, God delivering his, the Israelites out of bondage to the Egyptians. Here's what you need to know going into Exodus 1. In the beginning, Egypt was a good place for the Israelites. It had actually saved their lives. And to really appreciate the beginning of Exodus, you have to remember the end of Genesis. That's the book that comes before Exodus, if you're new to all this. The Israelites were actually just a group of 12 brothers and their families who wind up coming into Egypt and living in Egypt in the time of a great famine. That's basically how Genesis ends. How they got to Egypt is an amazing story that the last 13 chapters of Genesis tells. Some of you know this story. One of the, these 12 brothers, his name is Joseph, he was betrayed by the other 11 who sold him into slavery. Some of you remember this in Genesis 37. Joseph is carried off. The brothers have no idea what happened to him because they're just done with him. He's sold into slavery. He winds up in Egypt as a slave. The brothers tell their dad, Jacob, hey, Joseph got killed by a wild animal. They never anticipate seeing him again. Through the providence of God and a series of amazing events that you can read sometime, Joseph winds up serving as the king of Egypt's right-hand man. He's second in command of all of Egypt. And to make a long story short, it's God that enables Joseph Uh, to have a strategy for Egypt to survive a coming global famine. Not just survive, but Egypt is going to make money during the famine by helping to save a bunch of other nations from starvation in this global famine. Joseph basically comes up with the ancient version of an emergency savings account. How many of you have an emergency savings account? Not many hands, we're in trouble. Well, Joseph comes up with what I think is the first emergency savings account, only... Instead of saving money, Joseph is all about saving grain. He proposes to the Pharaoh, to the king of Egypt, to set aside for all the Egyptians to be made to set aside a portion of their grain every harvest and save it for a famine in the future. And so the king approves the plan. God had been working his life some too, if you remember some of the story. And for seven years, Joseph leads this massive building project of storehouses. Where, and, and not only that, he's overseeing basically the taxation of the people. He's collecting all the grain from the people throughout Egypt. And they're building these huge storehouses all throughout Egypt, storehouse cities. Um, well, guess what? The global famine hit, and Egypt was ready. And all their people had plenty of grain to live off of. But even more than that, people from other countries showed up to purchase Egypt's grain. Egypt got richer. It didn't just survive, it got richer, it saved other nations, and Joseph was the rainmaker. You ever heard that term? The rain, he making it rain, man. And the Pharaoh and Egyptian royalty and administration loved him because their people were saved and their, their country only grew more economically powerful. And wouldn't you know it, 
all of Joseph's brothers and their families who had sold Joseph into slavery all those years earlier wound up having to come to Egypt in order to survive. They had no idea that the brother they sold into slavery all those years earlier would in the end save their lives. And an incredible reconciliation happens between Joseph and his brothers. And Joseph has this epic line, Genesis 50 and verse 20, the very last chapter of Genesis, where Joseph says to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for the good. And the king of Egypt, out of appreciation for what Joseph had done, showed great favor to Joseph by saying, you know what, I'm going to give your family the best place to live in Egypt. And he settles them in the most fertile property of Egypt. And they have a job, basically, tending livestock. Uh, and so the king tells Joseph toward the end of Genesis, uh, verse chapter 45, bring your father and your families back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you can enjoy the fat of the land. Doesn't that sound good, you know? And so Joseph's brothers and their families live in the fat of the land, and they prosper for a while. Well, they plant there, and they have kids, and they have kids, and this family of just 12 brothers and their wives and some kids quickly morphs over time into quite a, a body of people. Now, practical question after a history lesson. You've done well with me so far. Have you ever had an experience in your life where you came into something, an opportunity, a job, a situation, a relationship, and early on you called it a blessing, but in the end it wound up oppressing you? Yeah. Early on you thought, this is it. But over time you went from blessed to oppressed. Now you're ready for Exodus 1. Picking up in verse 6. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. Okay, so it's, the writer's moving you along pretty forward. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Now let's stop right here. Have you ever heard somebody say, get it in writing? I remember my father telling me this when I got my first job out of school. Whatever your employer tells you, get it in writing. Why would he say that? This is why. He doesn't know it. This story right here. <laughs> because people forget. Time passes. New kings arise, new presidents arise, new leaders of the PTA arise, new city council people arise, new people come along, man. And this king has no memory and no affection of Joseph for Joseph and what he had done for Egypt all those years or decades earlier. Joseph means nothing, and even more than that, the vast number of Israelites now, they're making him nervous. Verse 9. Look, the king says to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. Now, the king doesn't want a fight. He doesn't want a revolt, but he doesn't want them to leave the country either because they're a good labor force. So what does he do? He's got to deal shrewdly. So here's what he does. Verse 11. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them. Stop right there. You think, well, how did all the Israelites just stand for it? How do you just, do you just all of a sudden decide, okay, yeah, I'll be your slave? No, this probably happened over time. Plus, remember, the Egyptians have all the resources, all the power, all the weapons, all the technology. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them. With forced labor, first time the word oppressed is used in Exodus, won't be the last. And they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. Now this is so ironic. The king uses ideas that he got from Joseph. 
Joseph invented the storehouses. Joseph was behind the store cities in another time, in another place. He uses the idea that he got from a Hebrew, from an Israelite, and he uses it to enslave the Israelites. You say, how does he enslave them? Well, here's the deal. If you can wear them out and keep them working all the time, they have less energy to make children. And they have less energy to think about having children. You can slow the population growth down. Plus, if you're worn out, you're less likely to organize and revolt. By the way, this is great advice for parenting. Just keep giving your kids more chores and stuff to do. It wears them out. They have less time to organize. They're so exhausted. It's free advice, free advice. Verse 12. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king's strategies are not working he's getting desperate if he can't wear them out he's just going to come out and try and wipe them out verse 15 through 21 the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives whose names were Shipra and Pua when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool if you see that the baby is a boy kill him this is amazing but if it's a girl let her live The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? And the midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They're vigorous. They give birth before the midwives arrive. In other words, these ladies are a lot stronger than the Egyptian women. They're working out in the fields. You know, they got stuff to do. They're not sitting around being pampered like the Egyptian women, although she's not saying that. They're just saying, I mean, these ladies can crank kids out because they got stuff to do. We're not getting there in time. So God was kind to the midwives. And the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own Pharaoh didn't count on the midwives being loyal to another king other than himself. And there's little question, they weren't exactly truthful with him when he asked them why they let the boys live. But before you go too far, I wouldn't exactly use this as a license to deceive people. There's no question God was pleased with their conviction about not taking a baby's life. The writer says that because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. And this is a great blessing, but it's not without its worries because Pharaoh escalates his oppression. Last verse of Exodus 1. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, every Hebrew boy that is born you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. This is the world that Moses is going to be born into, which begs a question the more you think about this story. What kind of God is this that would allow children to be born into a world like this? I mean, a king has all this authority. He's ordering baby boys to be thrown into the Nile, and God is still making his people fruitful, and they're still having children. What kind of God would do this? And the answer is the kind of God that's going to do something about this. Moses will appear on the scene next week, but we've already got enough to draw from for our time now. So many of the stories and themes in Exodus that we're going to walk through wind up being drawn upon by Jesus in his teaching through the rest of the New Testament. In fact, a lot of the language Jesus uses to talk about what he's come to do for people comes out of Exodus. You ought to track how many times Jesus uses the word slave. And how often he talks about setting people free in his language. And this is the story behind that. That he's come to free people from bondage. Bondage of all kinds. Bondage to sin. Bondage to the 
to, in, to the enemy? Well, the book of Hebrews comes along, and it uses stories from Exodus as metaphors or challenges to describe, hey, this is what it's like sometimes when you're seeking to follow Jesus. This is what it's like. You're going to deal with issues of fear and trust just like the Israelites did, and you're going to be challenged to persevere along the way. The story of Exodus is going to speak into your present. It's going to help you make some decisions. It's going to help you to take some action as a follower of Jesus, I believe. So let me leave you with some reflections from the opening of Exodus, Exodus chapter 1. The first is this. It so often takes adversity and difficulty to unsettle us when we've settled. It so often takes adversity and difficulty to unsettle us when we've settled. When it's all said and done, the Israelites will have been in Egypt for more than 400 years. What you're looking at and what you'll look at the next couple of weeks with me is about the last 80 years or so of their time because once Moses is born, the clock starts ticking. The reality is their time at the beginning was good. They were living off the fat of the land in the most fertile part of Egypt, and that led them to being in a position to be fertile in some other ways. They settle, they build homes, they multiply. It was God's will for them to multiply. We'll talk about that later in this series. But my point is this. I wonder, would they have ever wanted to leave Egypt had their circumstances not changed? In chapter 2, next week, you're going to see that they're going to be so miserable, they're going to start crying out to God to get out of Egypt. They're going to start crying out for deliverance. But chapter 1 sets the stage for them to cry out. Chapter 1 is the beginning of the unsettling. You know what the word exodus means? The word exodus means exit. Or departure but often you're not ready to do any of those things you're not ready to exit situations where you feel comfortable now some of you understand this you've heard the line before this is true for business it's true for family it's true for marriage it's definitely true for addiction it's true for sin until the pain of not changing exceeds the pain of changing you won't change I'm going to say it again. Until the pain of not changing exceeds your fear of the pain of making a change, you won't change. It takes discomfort to make you begin looking for an exit. It takes adversity and difficulty to unsettle you. Now, an evil Pharaoh is at work, but behind him, a God's at work in the midst of it all. They were never meant to be in Egypt forever. They were not made for Egypt. They were made for Canaan, the promised land. God had promised them back in Genesis, you're going to have a land of your own, and one day you will be there. They weren't made to stay in Egypt forever. Exodus isn't just about them being delivered from something. It's ultimately about them being delivered into something. Deliverance isn't just about you being saved from stuff. Deliverance is also about you being delivered into the land you were meant to live in and what you were meant to do. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in the New Testament when he says, Ephesians 2, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, say this next line with me, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Deliverance isn't just about being delivered from bondage, it's about being delivered into a new land, a purpose for which God made you for all along. But sometimes it takes an unsettling to awaken you so you can have a craving to move on, so you can have a craving to, to move forward. That's the Lord, by the way, that's calling right now. He's telling you, listen to this sermon. No, I'm joking. Um, I'm, I'm telling you, sometimes it takes an unsettling to awaken, to awaken you. And often difficulty and adversity is involved in that awakening. Isn't that the truth? Isn't didn't difficulty or pain or adversity of some kind unsettle you when you had settled for a while? And looking back, you're saying to yourself what Scott Wilson said in his testimony last week. He said, I don't ever want to go through it again, what I went through, the arrest, the shame, the, the living life in a drunk blackout. I, I would never want to go through it again. 
but I'm grateful it happened because of what it forced me to embrace. Often it takes adversity and difficulty to unsettle us when we've settled. Secondly, I think we learn from Exodus 1, there's a difference between the provision and the provider. Egypt was a provision for the Israelites at one time. It's what God used to save them from a famine. It was their provision, but God was their provider, and there's a difference. Please hear me out here. One of the things they're going to struggle with in Exodus is whether or not they want to leave Egypt. And even after they leave Egypt, sometimes they want to go back to Egypt. Why? You can take them out of Egypt, but taking them out of Egypt won't be near as much difficulty for God as it will be getting Egypt out of them. Sometimes we can wind up trusting in the provision more than the provider. Do you understand what I'm saying? How do you know when you're trusting in the provision more than the provider? I'm going to give you two suggestions just real quick. Pay attention to your level of anxiety. That's what's going to catch up with them later. They're going to start getting anxious. As miserable as they are, they're going to start getting anxious when they think about getting separated from the thing they've known for so long. Pay attention to your level of anxiety. So last week, my wife and I are having uh, some pie and coffee one afternoon with a couple at their home here from the branch. They've moved here not too long ago from the Northeast. It was a job relocation. They've never lived in Texas before. They've come from the Northeast. All their kids are back in the Northeast. And here they are in a new home that they've designed to help them host and care for their agent parent, aging parents should they need to take them in. And suddenly the job that brought them down here has gone away. Now just, I know this has never happened to any of you that everything always goes great for all of you, but try and imagine. Stretch yourself now. It goes away. And he's unemployed. And we're having coffee with them, and while obviously it can be a stressful time, Tara and I were both struck with their quiet, peaceful resilience and even their capacity to have some humor in the midst of this challenging time. And I soon saw why. I'm I'm up there with him in his home office, and I see his desk full of indications of job hunting. I can even see his computer screen, what he's doing. It's it's there for us to see. And while I'm looking at all and just feeling bad for him, he whispers to me, you know, the Lord is our provider, and he has a purpose. Now, those are people who know the difference between provision and provider. Those are people who know the difference between trusting in a provision and trusting in your provider. Second tip, pay attention to your anxiety. Second tip, pay attention to your choices. In chapter one, one, you see two women who have to make a choice as to which king they will serve. Will they serve the king of the culture they live in or will they serve the king over all? Will they serve the king who has everything to do with their provision right now? Or will they serve the king who is their true provider? And the choice they made did not go unnoticed by their true provider. In fact, did you notice you're never told the proper name of the king of Egypt? You just know him as Pharaoh. You're never told his proper name. But you're told the proper names of the two Hebrew midwives. God wants you to know their name. Because the choices they're making. Our anxiety and our choices reveal a lot about whether or not we're trusting in our provision or our provider. And speaking of our provider, I'll give you one more thought here, and it's about our provider, and it's this. Oppression will not go unnoticed by God. Oppression is a huge theme in the story of Exodus and throughout Scripture. And obviously, oppression is a huge theme today in our world. And there are some things we need to keep in mind Anytime we read stories of oppression in Scripture, anytime you witness oppression. And one of the big things you need to keep in mind is this. Oppression will not go unnoticed by God. When countries, when communities, and when individuals oppress others, there will be some kind of divine accountability. It's difficult to remember it, though, when you're not seeing the divine accountability. Because what you're reading about now 
80 years is about going to pass before Moses shows up. There are times where God is on a different timetable, but oppression is not going unnoticed. That's why it's important to hold on to stories like Exodus and verses like these. The psalmist said this in Psalm 103, 6, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He upholds the cause of the oppressed. And God would prove to do this with the Israelites in due time. Some of you know that at this story, some of you know that the king who ordered the killing of baby boys would eventually have to face the death of his own son and the death of Egypt's firstborn. The king who wants to drown babies in the Nile is eventually going to witness the drowning of his entire army. And when it comes to oppression, the question isn't, will God respond? God will respond. The question is, how will his people respond in the meantime? Here's what you learn from the two midwives. Every oppression forces a person to choose a side. God is on the side of the oppressed. What will you choose? It's interesting how often God calls for us to join him on the side of the oppressed. Psalm 82 and 3, defend the weak and fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Isaiah 1, 17, learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. You know what? Even the people who are oppressed have to choose. The remarkable thing is, the two Hebrew midwives are part of the oppressed population. But even though they're a part of the oppressed people, they are still in position of having to choose a side. And they got to choose. They're in proximity to the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh can take care of them. What will they do? And I think it's worth noting, they're in no position to issue a counter edict to the king. They don't try and release a new law. They don't try and set up a platform or anything like that. They're in, they have no authority whatsoever. So what do they do? They're going to be faithful in their moment with the people they're with right in front of them. Let me tell you what. You can't do everything for everybody, but you can do something for somebody. They can't issue an edict. They can't overrule the Pharaoh, but they can be faithful in the square footage around them. They can be faithful with the pregnant women they're in charge of. They can be faithful in that moment. And you can do something for someone where you are. I think about the woman who had a dream where she wandered into a shop and she found Jesus behind a counter. Jesus told her, you can have anything your heart desires. And she stopped in the dream. She paused. She thought, I probably would too. Jesus said, first of all, I'd wonder, is this a test? You know, is he... What am I going to ask for, you know? She thought for a second. And then she said, I want justice for the whole world. That was her request. Not bad. It's a pretty noble thing. She, she, was, she was told she could ask for anything she wanted. She asked for justice for the whole world. Jesus smiled and reached underneath the counter and pulled out a small packet and handed it to her. It wasn't large, and she shook it. She could tell it was like seeds, you know, or something. And she looks at him. She says, I asked for justice. And he said, I know. I don't sell fruit, only seeds. And those women sowed their seeds. They sowed their seeds. God used them. You know what? What they did meant that Moses had a chance to be born alive. You'll see that next week. There are deliverers behind every deliverer. And then there's the greatest deliverer of all, who, when you think about him, he reveals a king altogether different from Pharaoh. Earthly kings so often are always interested in shedding other people's blood to advance their cause. God's an altogether different king. He throws himself into the Nile. 
of death upon a cross to save us all from oppression. It's interesting that when Jesus came along, he used oppression to talk about his ministry. Luke 4 and 18, the spirit of the Lord is on me to set the oppressed free. You and I are a long way away from the difficulty and adversity of Egypt. But that doesn't mean we can't be enslaved. And there is one who's entered into our world to show us all the exit sign. There's one who's entered into our world to lead us all on an exodus of our own. And following Jesus can lead to exoduses of all kinds. Exoduses out of sin, out of shame, out of addiction, out of self-centeredness, out of apathy, out of indifference. The list goes on and on. And I would just ask you, what's your exodus that you long to go on? What are some exoduses that you've experienced in the past? Where have you settled? And I would ask you, wherever you've settled, don't you think it's time to get unsettled? And could it be that for at least some of us in this room, some of what we're experiencing in life, as hard as it is, may also be unsettling us? And that's a good thing. Because God has places for us to be, things for us to do. And God still has in mind for us the person he's calling us to become. And there's a deliverer who's come on the scene to set us free from bondage. Thanks be to God, right? I'm going to ask those serving communion to be going to their places. I want to leave you with three questions to ponder. You need to take a picture of these and ponder these throughout the rest of the week. Find one that touches your heart. What does it mean to you right now to trust more in the provider than the provision? What does that mean? To trust more in the provider than the provision. Number two, what's your exodus right now? What, what's your exodus right now that you would long for Jesus to lead you on, that he's calling you out of something? And then finally, what might it look like to walk in the steps of the midwives this week? You live in a culture that doesn't always go the way of the Lord. And you're in a minority. What will it mean for you to follow in their steps this week and to live by the conviction of a king that's greater than the kings of our culture? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your presence in this place right now. And we're thankful for you, Jesus, our great deliverer, for laying down your life that we might be delivered into a promised land of life abundantly, of fruitful and effective living for your glory. And I would say to anyone within the hearing of my voice today, if you have yet to look to Jesus as your deliverer, don't leave here today without allowing somebody to visit with you down front when we close. And let us pray with you for you. Because it's time to be unsettled and to move. Through Christ, amen.